Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I decided to film in a different location today. So I am sitting in the corner of my room because I didn't want to go out to my big bookshelves. So I have one of my little bookshelves behind me. Actually, it's, it's full size. It's just, I'm sitting on the floor in front of a different bookshelf because I don't want to go out to the big ones. Um, it's been a really weird couple of weeks. I've been working a ton and so I haven't gotten a lot of videos up. But I'm still getting a decent amount of reading done. Not, not as much as I'm used to. I think the, the quantity is as much as I'm used to, but the size of the books isn't. So I'm used to reading like, you know, 10, 600 page fantasy books. And now I'm reading 13. Well, one of my books is this big. So um, I'm here for my monthly wrap up. I just dropped books all over the floor. I also did like a real low key owls because I wanted to do the owls, but I didn't want to film it or anything. I didn't want to do a TBR. I just, I got busy at work. So for a little while there, I was working every day and working with middle school students is exhausting. So um, I figured I will show you the two couple books that I didn't read in the um, readathon as well as the one book that I DNF'd. So the one book I DNF'd is this one, and it's called Tangleweed and Brine. They are um, fairy tales, but they're with they have like a Irish twist, I guess. They're written by Irish author. It's written by an Irish author, and it's got pictures in it that are really cool. And they're supposed to like they actually say who they're based off of. So the stories are based off of like Cinderella and. Red Riding Hood and Rapunzel and all sorts of stuff. And I thought, oh, this is going to be amazing. I, I don't like them. I read one and a half stories and it drove me crazy. But this book is sentimental and it's beautiful. So as of right now, I'm still going to keep it. I'm just not going to read it because the language drove me kind of crazy. So I've got, I'm at kind of a weird angle. So I'm going to shift my camera just a little bit. So I have room to put up the um, books that... I don't have physical copies of. Don't mind me to look at my viewfinder because I'm making sure that I'm in focus. And my battery just started blinking. So I will go until it dies and then I'll plug it in and put the other one in. Luckily I have two. All right, so there was a couple books that I read that didn't, that weren't part of the readathon because I was just reading books and for the first couple of like a first week or so, I read, I was just reading books. And then I'm like, you know, I really want to do the owls. And so I decided to go through and figure out what I had that would fit and then just plug stuff in. Um, so I do have a couple that didn't fit and I was figured I would just share those with you. So the first one that didn't fit was The Brink of Darkness, which is the second book of the Edge of Everything books. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, you would know because it says One More Soul on the side of the first book. Um, I started it back in the summertime. So I read the first one while I was on my trip to Europe last summer. And then I started the second one because I had the arc of it and I never finished it. I got like 60% of the way through it and then I never finished it. And I was looking through my Kindle and I'm trying to read old arcs that I haven't gotten to because I want to be able to put up reviews for them because I feel bad that I got went through this little stint when NetGalley first approved me that I went through and I, I got a bunch of books and then I didn't read any of them. So I'm trying to go through and actually read these arcs. So you'll see them pop up periodically. Um, anyways, so I read this book, I read the first book of the series and I could not for the life of you tell you what it was about. All I could tell you was that it was about this guy with no name who eventually became known as X was a bounty hunter for all for all intents and purposes hell and he would come to the world and he would um, show these horrible people all the bad things that they have done and then take their souls to hell um, and then you have Zoe who uh, witnesses this happen so Zoe lives up in the mountains and one of her neighbors um, gets murdered. She's a little old couple gets murdered and the bounty hunter X comes and tries to take the soul of the murderer. She catches it in the act, thinks that it's a terrible thing to do. Why would you take this person's soul? 
and convinces him not to take it, which was bad because all sorts of mayhem happens when you don't take a bad person's soul, apparently. Um, because just because you're nice to them doesn't mean that they're going to change their ways. It's basically that the point, the moral of that point, part of the story was. But the problem was that I could not tell you, for, I could not tell you what the book was actually about. And the second book is kind of the same way. It's more of like a character book. There's not a big plot in it. Um, the basic plot of it is that Zoe and X are in love and trying to figure out why somebody who doesn't belong in hell is there as a bounty hunter. So that was the basics of that book. It took me forever to finish it. I did give it three stars. It was not a bad book. It just wasn't a book that held my attention for very long. So the second book that I read that I couldn't figure out how to fit into the series, um, into the readathon, was is The Glass Spear. Um, I was reading The Glass Spear with my friend Chris. She, uh, me and her are doing this book on haul challenge, which I actually need to start my next one. I got a little sidetracked and so I did a poll and the next one is ready to go. I just haven't started it yet. <laughs> And so I've tried to do like a reaction video to the books that we pick and this one I'm doing, I have one I'm doing on my own, but this one I was doing with her. Um, we read The Web Queen together and we both liked it a lot. Um, we read the novellas. She loved the novellas. I despised the novellas. <laughs> and then we started this one. I had to switch to the audiobook. And if I have to switch to an audiobook, it means that the book itself is not holding my attention tightly enough for me to keep going. So I probably would have DNF'd this if it hadn't been for the audiobook because that's just the way my brain works. If I can't read it, I usually can listen to it. So I have a couple a couple books that I put aside to, you know, as audiobook options. But I also like audiobooks and so that doesn't that's not necessarily an indicator. Like I have a couple of um books that I absolutely love listening to on audiobook, not because I need them on audiobook, but because I love the narrator. Like all of Marissa Meyer's books, I love Rebecca Soler, and she's one of my favorite narrators. And so I will, if I know a book is, is narrated by her, even if I want to read it, I'll just listen to it because I prefer listening to her books. <laughs> but um, this one was pretty good. If you know what the books are about, it's um, about Mare, and Mare is a red blood. And red bloods are normal people. Um, there's also silver bloods, and silver bloods are have magical powers of some sort, whether they're stone skins or they have um, fire abilities, or they can manipulate metal, or they can run really fast. Um, and they are broken up into families, and each family kind of keeps to their own power lines. Well, during this queen competition thing. Um, apparently the princes have to pick their wives for through this competition for basically whoever's the strongest. The strongest queen is the one that will reign. And um, during the competition there was an accident and Mare accidentally uh, let her power loose. And you find out that she's got powers before she realizes it. I mean, you know going in that this is what the book is about, the premise of the book is about the fact that she's a red and she has powers. And when you read the book, you see her use her powers before she realizes that she's using them. She just doesn't think about it. She's, it's just an automatic thing. She's using, manipulating her power without realizing it. But when she realizes it, it's kind of a big deal. Um, this is the sequel to it. There is four books right now, plus two sets of short stories. The newest set of short stories came out like this week. Um, I don't know if it just came out or if it's about to come out or what, but I know that it comes out either last Tuesday or this coming Tuesday. But this was the sequel to it and I don't know how to describe sequels without giving away big plot points of the books. At the end of the day, I enjoyed it. I kept listening to it. I did want to hear more about it, and I am planning on going on to the next one. Um, again, I'm probably going to listen to it. I actually don't have the physical copy for the next one, so I don't know if I'm going to buy it. I don't know if I was going to listen. If I like it, I'll buy it. I haven't figured that part out yet. But so far, 
I'm still liking these ones. And this was the last book that I read that did not fit. I tried to make it fit, but the only thing it would fit for was like red. And the red on the cover is really minimal. So I was like, eh, maybe I won't use that. So the rest of the books that I read this month are um, physical books that I had in the house or new arcs that I have. And then I made them all fit into the owls. So my goal was to do every challenge and I got all but one done. The only one I didn't get done was the uh, star in the title, which means I can't do anything that involves divinations or astrology because those all have the um, astronomy tab. I looked to see what I had for star in the title and I just didn't have anything I wanted to read. So my goal was to do the librarian uh, job which is right here. And for librarian, I needed um, ancient runes, arithmancy, uh, defense against the dark arts, history, magic, and transfiguration. So I did get all of those done. Those were my priority ones. And then I just kind of worked off of that and got as many of them as I could because I figured that worst came to worst. So I decided I didn't want to do the librarian when I got to Newt so I could do something else. And if I did as many as I could, I would have more options. And like I said, I did everything except for the star one because I just didn't have anything that would that I wanted to start. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna start at the top and work my way down. This is what I'm gonna go off of because I have them both listed out. I'm looking down, sorry. I have them all listed here. I have each of the um, challenges and then the book that I read for them. So I'm just gonna start at the top and work my way down. So the first book that I read was Ancient Runes. And it was, okay, keep in mind, I did not read these in order. This was just the first one on the list. So the first book on the list was a retelling and I read The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein. I um, read the first three chapters of this like, over Halloween and could not get into reading it. So this was an audio book because I could not get into the physical read, which is fine. Sometimes you just aren't in the mood and sometimes you just need to absorb the book in a different method. Um, I decided to listen to it to see if I could read it that way and I did. I enjoyed it immensely once I switched to the audiobook because the narrator was pretty good um, and the story was definitely creepy and it definitely lends itself to be a story to be told versus a story that you read yourself if that makes sense because you know some of those old stories they just they're better being listened to. But um, I've never read Frankenstein. I saw the Frankenstein movies when I was a kid. Um, I don't think I ever saw the original Frankenstein, but I saw like all the remakes of it. And so I figured that this would be kind of a fun little tryout. And the basic premise of this is that you have Elizabeth. Elizabeth was orphaned when she was real little. She didn't remember not being orphaned. And she got stuck with this woman and this woman would regularly beat her. Um, said that she was just worthless and the only thing that she did was that she fed her just enough and protected her just enough to make sure that she was still beautiful. So she would like beat her but not her face. And she kept saying that she was from this um, really wealthy line of people and that her only worth was her family history which of course Elizabeth doesn't believe. She thinks that she was just blowing smoke um, for people to try to take this girl off her hands. So the Frankensteins came and needed help for their son, Victor. Um, Victor is <laughs> Dr. Frankenstein. And um, he kind of acted a little weird. He wasn't socially acceptable and they needed somebody to help buffer him. So they, for all intents and purposes, bought Elizabeth for Victor. And the book is based off of Elizabeth's point of view. So the book runs on one main line about how Victor went off to college and she's really worried about her place in the household. She's worried that she's gonna be kicked out because she's no longer needed um, as a buffer for Victor. And um, it goes back in time and you get to see progression from when they first met, through stories, through memories about their childhood together, as well as this main line of her trying to find Victor at university and bring him home so that way she has a place to stay. I did look up information about the actual, I looked up the Sparks notes, 
on the actual Frankenstein to figure out what some of the stuff was going on. I had no idea and I did most of it after the fact because I didn't want to ruin myself for the book. Um, but I liked it. I thought it was really interesting. The, my favorite part was the author's note because uh, Kirsten White actually says that the reason that she decided to do Frankenstein from Elizabeth's point of view was because um, of Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley was like 16 years old when she wrote Frankenstein and she did it on a bet. Um, her husband was telling her that she needed to do something so that she wasn't idle and as like a lark she decides to write a book. Mary Shelley says that her husband is the reason why she uh, wrote this book and all of it goes to him da, da 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 and she won't take any of the accolades for herself or she wouldn't at the time take any accolades for herself and that really annoys Kirsten and so she wrote in the author's note that she wishes that that Mary had taken some, you know, accomplishment in her own work and not just given it all to her husband. And so she wrote this from the point of view of a teenage girl because teenage girls are scary, which I can attest to because I have one. Um, I liked it a lot. I gave it four stars and um, I think that the audiobook was a massive draw to it. I don't know if I would have given it such a high rating if I'd actually read it. But there's something about hearing all this stuff that was kind of creepy. I liked it. So our next challenge was arithmancy, and arithmancy is two or more authors. And I've been really interested in trying Christina Lauren. So um, Christina Lauren is two women, Christina and Lauren, and they write together. They write romances. Um, they do have a couple of YA uh, books. One like small duology called Sublime, and I don't think that one's romance but I'm not sure. But so for the most part, they write adult romances, which is what this is. It is about two people, Holland and Calvin, and I've been trying to figure out the best way to describe this book without getting too long-winded. So Holland lives and works in New York City because she wants to be near her uncles, and her uncles are, one of her uncles produces a musical in New York and which is very, very successful. So Calvin is a street performer and he's an amazing street performer and Holland is kind of in love with him, you know, from a distance, not like she knows him or anything, but she's like admires him and has a little crush on him. And they need a musician for this production that her uncle's doing and he fits the bill, except for one thing he's illegal. Rumi's is basically a green card marriage and of course it's a romance. They're gonna fall in love. That's the way all romances go but there's quite a bit of interesting little turmoils in here. I have had the hardest time trying to figure out how to describe this book so I'm just gonna leave it at that. I very much enjoyed it and if you guys ever want to see all the blubbering idiot outtakes I'll have to show you because I tried like four times to explain this book and couldn't do it. I don't know why. I just couldn't. All right. Next. Next was supposed to be astronomy, but I didn't read anything because we went over that already. So the next one was Care of Magical Creatures, and it was supposed to have a land animal on the cover. I stretched this one just a tiny bit because I read the Tea the, the Dragon Society, and well, there's dragons on it, and dragons are land animals, right? mythological land animals. This works, right? I, I swear it works. So this was the only um, graphic novel that I read this month, but it was really cute. My daughter kept bugging about it. I've been wanting to read it forever. And when it came in one of the Alcrate boxes, I thought, okay, this is perfect. I'll have to read this. Um, I do want the big version because the big version is so pretty. And this one is cute. And I'll just like give this one to Elise and then buy the real, the big one for myself. Plus I want to see what else she done, who's, she's done because I think this was just a very sweet, cute book. It's about these little dragons that um, have leaves or flowers or some sort of tea apparatus growing out of them. And it's supposed to be like this um, lost art to be able to care for and cultivate the leaves off of these dragons because the dragons are very, um, sensitive and they most people don't take the time and effort to appreciate taking care of these animals and the wonderful 
um, teas that they make. At the end, there's this huge list of different teas. I don't know if this is a, the full copy or if there's more to it than this, but it's really cute. So we have uh, like a jasmine tea dragon, uh, riboso, we have chamomile and ginseng, and all of these different dragons grow these special teas, and most people just don't care about them, but the dragon tea society does. So this is just the sweetest little graphic novel I've ever read. That one was fast and easy. <laughs> The next one that I read was um, Under Charms, and that's an adult book, and I've had plenty of adult books to choose from, so I just basically picked one and that didn't fit anything else and put it in here. So for the charms, I read um, Once Upon a Bad Boy, which is the third book in the Sometimes I'm in Lo Sometimes in Love series that Melanie Johnson, yes, Melanie Johnson has coming out. Um, the first one should actually be out either recently or about to come out. I got a notification that I need to order it because the real thing is out. Um, this is her debut series. So far it's three books long. I have a feeling it's going to be five. And each of the books follows a different main character and a different love interest. And so we are on book three right now. And we are following Sadie. Um, Sadie is an actress and she is trying to make a name for herself because her family has a lot of money and it's kind of one of those situations where she doesn't want to be judged based on her family's money. She wants to be judged on her own talents, which I find very admirable, but she has a lot of problems with it because everyone thinks that she gets all of her jobs through her family's connections. Well, this is her first big job, her first leading role, and the she comes in the first day to read lines and finds out that the um, stunt coordinator is her first and only love. And so it's kind of a second chance romance, and it's really, really cute. So far, this series is one of my favorite adult romances that I've read in a long time. These books are a little more on the substantial side. They have more background, they've got more issues, they have more umph to them, but they are just, they're really sweet. And this one is the same way. This one probably is the lightest of the books in a lot of ways. This one's more of an emotional, um, they're going on more of an emotional journey, less of a physical journey. And I think that's really sweet. I like it a lot. It's definitely a second chance romance. And I have not figured out which romance trope is my favorite one, but I definitely had fun with this one. And I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing the next two books. So far I've gotten arcs of every single one of her books, just all three of them. And I'm hoping that this continues because I really, really like them. Okay, so the next one is Defense Against the Dark Arts and that was to read a book that starts with R. And it just so happens that I got another arc this month and it was called Rosie's Traveling Tea Shop. And um, it was really cute. It's, it starts off with this sous chef. Rosie comes home from work on her birthday. She made herself a little uh, dessert to bring home and share with her husband. And her husband's waiting there for her and she thinks, oh great, my husband waited up for me because it was like two o'clock in the morning. And he dumped her on her birthday, which I don't think he knew was her birthday, but still the fact that he dumped her on her birthday. Um, they'd been married for, you know, quite a few years, I think it was like five years or something. And he just out of the blue dumped her. It turned out that he was cheating on her and that he was dating somebody that he worked with in his restaurant because they were both sous chefs. The restaurant she worked at was one of the best in the city. And this was London, so it's like one of the best ones in London. And his was, a decent one, but not by far the best. So she goes through this like existential crisis and can't figure out what she wants to do with her life now that she's divorced and she doesn't want to deal with all the drama because apparently the uh, chef ring is a very dramatic uh, spread rumor type of situation and she didn't want to deal with that. So in a drunken haze, she bought a tea shop, I guess. She bought a food truck and that she wanted to make into a tea shop with like pastries and snacks but most of it was based upon the fact that she loves making specialty tea blends so you spend part of the book going through and seeing her transition from being married to being single to living out of a truck and then you see her begin to take this journey and learning about 
why this nomadic lifestyle could possibly be good for her. And of course, at the heart of it, it is a romance. Um, I do, I did like it a lot, but it wasn't my favorite. The problem was, is that the pacing was bad. So you spent half the book, maybe half the book, a decent chunk of the book, watching her leave her life and start this nomadic life. But the nomadic life went so quick and then the end of it just wrapped up. And I was just like, okay, that was a little abrupt. Um, Goodreads says the book is 384 pages long, but I, it doesn't feel like that. Maybe it was, maybe it's just spent so long on the, her getting out of her old life and into her new one that I didn't realize it. It just, it wrapped up way too fast. I have no idea what the reasoning behind that was, but again, this is an arc, so I don't know if that's different in the physical, the final copy or not, but it just, yeah, it just wound up too fast for me. So I gave it three stars. I really much enjoyed it. I just was annoyed that the end of it was just there and gone. It's like, oh, look, here's the big problem. It's gone now. We'll move on to Divination. So Divination is set in the future. <laughs> I may have cheated a little tiny bit on this one. So I got the art red, white, and royal blue, and um, a lot of people have been hearing about this this book, and I uh, attest that it is a very, very good romance novel. So it's about Alex. Alex is the first son. Um, his mother is president, so there's some, some political, a lot of political talk in this book because it has to do with um, presidential campaigns and stuff. And it's also about Henry, one of the sons of one of the princes of England. So the theory here is this is a slightly alternate universe set one year in the future. Um, it's set in 2020, um, the election year. So Alex's mom is going for a second term. She is the first female president. Um, it's a lot of political stuff because there's so many like things they can and can't do, things they can and can't say because they have to think about the voters. And uh, Alex goes to one of the Prince of England's weddings. So not Henry, not the one that he's had, that he has a problem with, but Henry's older brother is getting married and he's at the wedding. And they get into a fight and knock over the cake. And of course, in all this stuff, there's a bunch of pictures, there's all sorts of like, uh, oh my gosh, this huge rivalry. And so for it's a massive PR nightmare. And so in order to make the PR be better, they decided that they should pretend to be friends. And um, during this pretending to be friends, they actually become friends. And then they become lovers. Um, I don't... So the reason that she wrote this was as a, you know, she started it during Hillary's campaign. And then uh, she wrote this author's note at the back that kind of bothered me. And I don't know if it would bother anybody else or if it's just me, if I'm just weird, but it was kind of passive aggressive to me. So you have this author's note at the end that talks about how she started writing this during Hillary's um, campaign because she thought it would be so great to have the first female president and then when she didn't get elected when Trump did um, she kind of threw up a temper tantrum and stopped writing the book and then refused to write the book and then now she realized that okay well I'm gonna make it so it's my perfect utopia of what if a woman was president and it kind of bothered me that she had this passive-aggressive attitude towards it and that she was gonna put aside um, this dream of writing a book simply because she was annoyed at the political climate at the time. Political climates change constantly. We, it's why we have uh, elections every four years is to change the political climate. So I'm like, why would you give up writing a book that you loved simply because you didn't get your way politically? Um, but the book itself was amazing. The love story was very sweet. The family dynamics were great. Being able to see how um, Alex's mom really stood behind him and she says a bunch of times throughout the story because it's a lot of political stuff. So there is two different sides to this. You have Alex's side whose mom is a president and is going up for re-election. And then you have Henry's side of this where Henry is the a crown prince 
in England. And for Henry, it's not okay to be gay. It's just, it's not a thing. It's not okay. And for Alex, it's completely okay, but they don't want to start any unnecessary drama that could affect the campaign if it's not important. And so it kind of goes through, you know, the political sides of it, it goes through the romance sides of it, it goes through the family obligation sides of it. And overall, I loved, loved, loved this book. And I had, based on the book alone, I give this five glowing stars. And based off of the author's note, I give this just five stars. So that it didn't affect my rating at all, but it definitely did affect how I see the author. And hopefully she's young and grows out of it. Hopefully she's not old and stubborn and set in her ways. I have no idea. I don't know think about the author. Anyways, so that little tangent aside, let's go back to what I was actually doing. So Herbology is next, and that one is a plant on the cover. I read In an Absent Dream, and it has a tree on the cover. So this is the fourth book in the Wayward Children series. I don't know how to describe these books. They're only like 200 pages long, give or take a little. So the first book is Every Hard Doorway, and if you've never heard of it, I'm shocked. You probably are new to booktube, um, or new to books in general, because these books have been everywhere. They've been like this massive thing, and the book five just got announced and has a cover and everything. I don't know when, they, when it's actually coming out, but it got announced. So the Every Hard Doorway books are all about these kids who go through doorways into other worlds and then have to come back. So the theory is um, what happens to the Narnia kids when they come back? What happens to Alice when she comes back? What kind of different effects um, mentally and physically does it have on the children? who get to experience another world and then can't stay. Some get to go back, some are banished forever, that kind of thing. So this one, if you read the first book, is about Lundy, who's one of the teachers. Um, if you read them in order, uh, in publication order, she, she's had two prequels. She's had um, Every Heart of Doorway, which was the first one, and she has Down and Bung, The Six and Bones, which was a prequel about a set of kids from the first book. And then you have the third book, which is a continuation of the first book. And then you have the fourth book, which is another prequel about another character from the first book. That makes sense at all. So this one's about Lundy. And um, her door goes to the goblin market. And I don't know what I expected a goblin market to look like, but that's definitely not what I expected it to look like. And I liked it so much. My only, only negative on this is that again it ended too abruptly and I just you know you could see it coming up to it but you I expected there to be more about the ending it just ends and I'm like okay this is the default to writing a tiny little 200 page book and having it set over the course of like 10 years um she goes through the door the first time when she's nine so it's um, and then she, the last time she goes through the door, she's almost 18. So it's an, about a nine year spread. But you have nine years in that much book. And most of it, the way she writes it, the story that she tells, you don't realize that you're going through massive numbers of years in a blink of an eye. But I always want more out of these books. Um, I think some of them, they're perfect just the way they were. Some of them you just want a little more. And this one one, the only part that I really needed more of was the very, very end. Um, the conclusion, how it all wrapped up. It's like when you, if you've read the first book, you know kind of, you have a feeling you know where it's going, but you have no idea how it gets there. And then by the time you finally figure out how it gets there, the book is over. And I'm just like, okay, I get this is a prequel. And so you kind of know what happens to Lundy because if you've read the first book, but it still bothers me that there wasn't something else, some sort of reaction, some sort of whatever. I don't know. I just I feel, like, I feel like it needed something. And I would love to find out from people who have also read it if they found that the ending was also jarring. But overall, 
Still love this book, still love the series. Looking forward to the next books, that are, the next book that comes out. And I think there's supposed to be a fair number of them. She said she would keep writing them as long as people keep loving them. And we're up to, this was four, so five is coming out. I'm assuming in a year, because this one came out in January. So I'm assuming that the next one will come out in January too. All right, so the next book was um, History of Magic. Next challenge is History of Magic. And you're supposed to read a book that's more than 10 years old. Uh, I listen to Harry Potter when I sleep, which will be stopping very, very soon. My husband leaves in a week. And when he leaves, I am switching to a book that he hasn't read yet, but I have. And so I didn't want to spoil it for him. So I've been listening to Harry Potter over and over and over again. And I still absolutely love Harry Potter. So I have no qualms about continuing to listen to them, but I'm excited to be able to listen to this other book series that I have in mind. Anyways, um, I read Prisoner of Azkaban this month listened to, laid in bed, and dreamt about. Something along those lines. So basically the, how I do this is I set a sleep timer on my phone and I start listening. And then when I wake up in the morning, I rewind back to where the last thing I heard and then start from there again. But last month I finished um, The Prisoner of Azkaban and all the Harry Potter books have been out for way more than 10 years. Some of them over 20. I think that um, Prisoner of Azkaban is on 19 right now or just hit 20 or something like that. Um, I know that that's the book that's going to come out next in the special covers, the special 20th edition of covers. That's the one that's coming out next. So I'm assuming that means it's coming in on its 20 year mark. So I figured that one will work great and I love the Harry Potter books. And if you don't know about Harry Potter, I'm shocked because I think there's only a handful of people on the face of the planet that probably don't know something about Harry Potter, if not have watched or read or something in that world. All right, Muggle Studies is a contemporary book and like 95% of the books that I've read this month are contemporaries. And this one is also a contemporary. This is only his. Um, this is one of the Susan Mallory books. I have more right here behind me. Uh, I, it's a 20 book series and I had started reading them and I was getting them from fifth books and it took like a month and a half to get here. Sometimes it takes a week. Sometimes it takes almost two months. And this is one of the ones that took almost two months. I don't remember which one this is. I think it's like number six. Um, but this one is about one of the twin the triplets. So this is the third triplet. This is Nevada. Nevada is a townie that lives in Fool's Gold. She is um, a construction worker and she works for her brother, formerly for their father's construction company. When their father passed away, their brother got the company and she just went directly from school to working for her brother and never actually had to try for a job. So they have this new construction um, company coming into town that's building this enormous uh, hotel casino thing up in the mountains and they're not using the town the town's construction company they're using this new one because it's um on native land and you have to be native in order to buy the land and the family is both na is native so they were um they bought up a bunch big chunk of land and we're gonna have have want to build this big casino thing and she thinks that this would be a great opportunity for her to branch out and show what she can really do without being given it. So she does an interview and gets the job and she's now working for Tucker. Um, Tucker, again, I had like a second chance romance thing going this month. It was a second chance romance. Um, she met him when she was in college. He was a friend of her brother's and she had this massive, massive crush on, on him and he was dating a artist. And the artist was one of those all-consuming, completely head over heels and love type thing and lust. He was not in love, he was in lust with her. And wanted to be around her constantly and was just like brought in by her orb. Um, so him and this, mo and this model, this, him and this artist broke up and she saw it as an advantage to get to know him better and they had like this whirlwind like one night stand that was her first time and it was horrible and she has all these horrible memories for it and so when she went to apply for the job she thought she was going to be applying to work with his father and not with him and when she found out that she's working with him she kind of had this like crisis moment um but they're working together and it's their love story 
it's a romance. There's very few romances that I've read where they don't have a happily ever after. There are some, but these are not them. These are these sweet ones that you expect to have the happily ever after. And I liked it, it was cute. Um, I've liked all of Slow Matter's books so far. They are very sweet and fluffy and that kind of book. <laughs> Anyways, we'll move on to the next category. Ooh, we are almost out of categories. Okay, so the next category is potions and it's a sequel. I read The Everlasting Rose. Listen to The Everlasting Rose. I bought it on audiobook. Um, I listened to Bells and I loved the narrator for it. And um, it was one of those challenges. I had Chris pick my TBR and it was back in September, October. And she picked the bells because she was curious what I would think of it. Um, and I had a bunch of books I needed to read. And I couldn't find an audiobook for any of them except for Bells. So Bells was one of those ones that I didn't go out of my way to get an audiobook because I wasn't liking the book. It was more of a, I always have an audiobook on hand and I needed one. And that was what was available. So I got the audiobook for Bells. And so because I got the audiobook for Bells, I got the audiobook for The Everlasting Rose. Um, which is decently shorter. I want it to like 100 pages shorter than the first one. And I can see where they left it open for more books in the future. And I do plan on buying the physical copy at some point in time because I've already listened to it. I'll probably do the same thing that I did with Legend. Um, and I'll wait until it comes on Book Outlet and buy it there because that's what I do for the most part. Unless I need a book right away, like I just, I couldn't wait for this one, so I just bought this one when it came out. But um, if I can wait, and I've already read it, and I'm not needing it right away, I wait until it hits Book Outlet, and I buy it from there because it's considerably cheaper. So I'll probably do that with Everlasting Rose. I'll probably just wait until it hits um, Book Outlet, but then I'll buy it because I did like the book quite a bit. Um, the Bells, if you've never heard of it, is about this group of girls um, that apparently has been shrinking over the years. It used to be quite a large group and now it's a very small group. And they uh, are sent from heaven because they're beautiful and they're sent to beautify the world. So everybody is born gray um, with bright red eyes, gray skin, gray hair, nothing. I mean, they have good structure, but they don't have any color and to this world the color is what makes them beautiful and there's also some like side effects to being gray um i guess it can kind of hurt to be gray that your eyes especially because they are bright red and they're kind of dry and then your hair is really brittle and will fall out so you have this thing where you have these people that are gray and they feel like they're ugly and then you have the bells that are beautiful they're an array of colors so you have every color under the rainbow as far as human skin tones from the palest pale to the darkest black. And um, they are magnificently beautiful. They have great skin tones, they've got great hair colors, they have this, they're just the rainbow. And when they were as more of them, there was a broader range. Now we only have a handful, so we still have the range, we just don't have as many in the range. The bells have the power to give beauty to other people and so they will play with skin tones and hair colors and eye colors and you have a couple people who prefer to be darker and a couple people that prefer to be lighter and you have an arrange of different hair colors that they want from platinum blonde to bright red to black to different textures curly straight and you have all this different stuff that they can do with these people that they can change them by using um, their arcana which is like their special magical power to make things beautiful but it's a corrupt system and um, there's a lot of drama and corruption based around all of these books. Um, the first book, it talks about how the girls all get placed and they get placed in these tea houses or as a favor get placed at the um, palace to work with the, king, the queens and princesses and stuff. But it's a very flawed system. You've got a lot of political dynamics. You have um, some people who have power that shouldn't. And it's just, I don't know, it's a really interesting story. I definitely like the second one, but I feel like it needed a little something again. That was like the theme of this month, that if there was anything that I disliked about a book, it was that it was missing something. 
and I I know that Danielle Clayton left it open enough so that she could possibly do more books in the future. And I don't know if she left it so open because she was hoping to write more books in the future, but as of right now, it is just a duology. There isn't any more books coming out, but she did say that there is a possibility that sometime in the future she'll have more. Um, overall, I liked a lot. I gave it four stars. I liked Bells a little bit more, but I think that was just because there was Okay, so it's a, this is a really, really minor spoiler. So if you don't want any spoilers at all, then I'm sorry, here it is. I'll put my hand down when the little tiny spoiler is over. Um, they have this group of women who are the spiders and the spiders are gray. They are trying to be as natural as possible because they're trying to get away from the beauty regimes. And when you first meet the spiders, they do this like really stupid salute thing where they like talk in unison and have their motto and do this little dance thing that I thought was absolutely stupid and absolutely ridiculous and actually took a little tiny bit away from the books for me because it was annoying. And they did a little bit abbreviated version of it through the book and I'm just like, stop doing it. So there's my little spoiler. I hope that those of you who have read it will let me know if it if it was a what you thought of my little spoiler. And those of you who didn't, I hope you didn't just kind of skimmed over it, which is what I do when I know there's a spoiler for a book that I haven't read and I want to. I always just you know skim over those little sections. Okay, so the last one is Transfiguration and it's a red cover. Um, I tried to make this one my red cover. But as we know, I DNF'd it. So um, I have a little military library on base, on um, one of the bases, we have several bases. We have one of our bases has a little library that has a big bookshelf outside in the hallway. It's a take and leave situation. And because I am working, me and my kids are all working on unhauling, which I should have done a little video on this and I didn't think about it until after it was done. So whoops, sorry. So every time I go to the library, I try to bring some books to drop off and I look through the books and if there's anything I want to pick up. Um, I do have some books that I picked up and again, they're right here. Um, that I dropped off a bunch of my kids' old books. So like I must have dropped off 20 different um, Goosebump books and just little kid chapter readers. Um, not, like, not like picture books, but you know, like the chapter type books. So I brought a bunch in and I ended up leaving with, I probably brought in 50 and I ended up leaving with like 10. And one of the books that I left with was a book that I read ages and ages and ages ago. When I first started um, reading books, I went for like Harry Potter and Twilight and those types of books. Eventually I went back, I, I worked my way into romance. And then for some reason I stopped reading romance really suddenly and I hadn't read it for like five or six years and then I started reading it again. Um, and I forgot how much I loved it. And I don't know why I stopped reading it in the first place, but I did. But this was one of the very first books I ever read was a book about by Katie McAllister. Um, Katie McAllister's got quite a few books. She's got a bunch of just straight contemporaries. Um, she's got a whole line of books about vampires. And these are all about dragons. I saw this on the shelf and I know I have a copy somewhere. I think I have it in uh, storage in Alabama, but I can't get to my storage unit because that was military packed up and you can't touch that stuff. So when we move again, I will get all the stuff out of storage because there's things in there. I just, I'm constantly worried that it, everything in there is being mistreated because I saw how they packed it up and it was bad. But they had a bunch of, I had a, I had a bunch of romance books in there and this was one of them. And I remember loving this book. So I grabbed it off the shelf, which makes me feel a little weird because I grabbed a book I already have but I, I, haven't, I don't have any access to. So when we move, I'll just go put it back. <laughs> I figured that would be the easiest way to go about doing it. So I'm basically borrowing a book from the, the free shelf on the, at the library. Um, but I ended up rereading this and it's very red. So this is her book about um, dragons. And this is the first book in the dragon series. Uh, the only reason I started rereading it was because I found out that there is two new series, sections of the series. So each of the series is based on one dragon. This is about the green dragons. Um, and 
there's four books about Aslan and her green dragons. So Aslan is from the estates and she goes to France with um, as a, you know, for, as a courier, courier service. Well, her uncle works, owns this antiquities type of shop and she he hires people to curry the merchandise that gets sold all over the world. And so this woman in France buys this little figurine of a dragon. And um, when she gets to France to drop it off, the woman's dead. And in the uh, apartment with the dead woman is this man. Aslan automatically assumes that this man killed her and he says that he didn't kill her and notices that she's carrying gold on her because he can smell it and steals this dragon from her. She is completely mundane when it comes to this stuff. She has no idea what's going on. She has no idea what the dragon was that she was holding. She has no idea who the man is that could smell the gold. And she has no idea what sort of ritualistic stuff is going on because it looks like there's a circle drawn around this hanging woman. Um, so she gets to find out. She spends the entire book finding all about the other world. She finds out about dragons. She finds out about guardians and demons and witches and all sorts of stuff. And um, they're really cute books. I remember absolutely loving this book. I remember it devouring it and thinking it was the greatest thing in the entire world. It's not. On a reread, it's definitely not the greatest thing in the entire world, but it's still cute and I still enjoyed it. And it was so long ago that I read it that I had completely forgotten all the twists and turns and could not remember who anybody was. So all that I can remember was there was a snarky dog in it. And the snarky dog is a demon and he has no powers and I love him and he's hilarious and it's got a lot of uh, Katie McAllister's books are always full of action, full of, most of them are full of supernatural people, like there's a, there's a group that's not, but most of her books are based off of some sort of supernatural entity and they always have a funny sidekick and they've got a powerful woman, in this case they have a massive douchebag for a love interest, which was probably one of the biggest downsides to it is that I really hated Drake and he didn't bother me before because he was like this big tough dragon but I despised him in this book. I didn't despise him the first time I read it which makes me wonder if my tastes have changed and I no longer want the douchebag which just makes sense because I married one of the nicest guys I've ever met in my entire life so I don't know I think I've grown past the douchebag stuff and if I remember correctly he does chill out but I don't remember for sure. Um, most of the series was at the library so I have most of it so I do plan on finishing it because I do want to get to the ones I haven't read. I haven't read um, I read the first two, so I think what I was getting at originally was there's four books in this series and then there's four dragons and each dragon has four books. I read all of the, uh, of the first dragon and all of the second dragon, but I have not read the third or the fourth. And when I found out there was more books to the series, I started rereading them. Wow, this is going to be a really long video to edit because my camera has shut off on me three times, which means that it's already like an hour long. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up. See, I read 13 books this month and that I pretty much enjoyed everything I read, um, minus my DNF. Nothing was below three stars. Uh, I don't have a new favorite out of this group, but I definitely enjoyed everything that I read. Um, we get to May and that's gonna change because I started reading the Outlander series at the very end of April and I read the bulk of it in May, so I'm gonna put it in the May group, but I'm just gonna suffice to say that I think I have a new favorite. And that's it. I'll talk to you guys later. Um, hope this isn't too long. I guess my wrap ups, I might have to start doing them in two parts because 13 books is a lot to go over. And I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.